Very good. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone, and thank you for attending our College of Natural Sciences webinar. My name is Alison Sherwood. I'm the Interim Associate Dean for the College of Natural Sciences. And through our Polina Au webinar series, we are hoping to bring some of the first class research that happens in the College of Natural Sciences to our broader community. Today's presentation is going to be by Dr. Kim Binstead. She's a professor in the Department of Information and Computer Sciences. Dr. Binstead received her BSc in Physics from McGill University and her PhD in Artificial Intelligence from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. She then went to Japan where she conducted research at Sony's Computer Science Laboratories on human computer interfaces and also started a company to develop social agents for cell phones. In 2002, she joined the Information and Computer Sciences Department at the University of Hawaii, where she is now a full professor and she conducts research on astrobiology and long duration human space exploration. She also completed an MS degree in planetary geology in 2015, which I think is very cool. Dr. Binstead was a NASA Summer Faculty Fellow at the Ames Research Center, 2003-2004. She was Chief Scientist on the FMARS 2007 Long Duration Mission, a four-month Mars exploration analog in the Canadian Arctic. In 2009-2010, she spent her sabbatical as a visiting scientist at the Canadian Space Agency. She spent six months in 2016 and 2017 in Russia on a Fulbright Award and was a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Congressional Fellow in 2018-2019. Dr. Binstead is Principal Investigator of the NASA-funded High Seas or Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation Project, which conducts long-duration space exploration simulations. Her hobbies include flying, diving, kayaking, cooking, and improvisational comedy. And so now I'd like to welcome Dr. Binstead. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for having me and for that excellent introduction. Um, okay, so let's get started. I'm just gonna share my screen. Does that look all right? Okay, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is HICES. That's the last part of, of the introduction. And HICES stands for Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by analog and simulation in this situation. But the research question we're trying to answer is essentially can humans live on Mars without each other? So, do we have the psychological and social and teamwork skills? to carry off a two and a half to three year long mission to Mars and back uh, in a way that's, that's safe and productive. So getting to Mars, there's a lot of challenges. And some of those challenges are about getting there, you know, the rocket, the spaceship, uh, the life systems there and back, uh, protecting the crew against radiation, which is particularly troublesome en route, but also is gonna be a problem when you're on the surface of Mars because Mars doesn't have a magnetosphere or much of an atmosphere to protect the crew. Um, low and microgravity, so en route, uh, there's, it would be microgravity, essentially zero G. Uh, and then on Mars, Mars has about one third of Earth's gravity. So there's still gonna be issues there. Resources, uh, how is the crew going to get the water, the energy, the food, um, and so on that they need to survive? And also, how are they going to get the fuel to come back again? Uh, and those are all questions about uh, resources, and in particular, what you have to bring with you and what can you potentially extract or grow uh, on Mars. Uh, but our research and the research I'm going to talk about today doesn't deal with any of those at all. Here, we're focused on issues to do with the distance from Earth. And Mars is a really long way away. So as I said, it's a two and a half to three year long mission. That's a really long time, much longer than humans have ever been in space before. Uh, the crew will be really isolated. We think we're isolated here in Hawaii, but uh, they are gonna be much, much, much farther from Earth than any other uh, humans have ever been. Uh, the psychological health of the crew, 
is very important. Uh, they're going to be stuck with each other for all of that time. Um, they're not really going to be able, they're not going to be able to interact in real time with other humans. And we need them to stay psychologically healthy, not just for their own good, but because if a, the, a mission to Mars is a system of systems, right? Uh, there's the, the rocket systems, mechanical system, chemical systems, and so on. And then there's the human part of that system. And if the human part breaks, it can be just as catastrophic as if the rocket blows up. So we really need that crew to be uh, physically and psychologically healthy and working well together. And finally, there's the time delay or latency. So the time it takes for uh, the speed of light, for light to get, light or a radio wave to get between Earth and Mars varies from about five minutes uh, to about 25 minutes. And that depends on the positions of the two planets relative to each other. So when they're together on the same side of the sun, it takes less time. When they're on the opposite sides of the sun, uh, it takes much longer. And that delay is really different from what we have seen in our current space missions where they've always been within um, a couple light seconds from Earth. So you don't get that delay. But when you're on Mars, you can't just pick up the phone or pick up the radio and talk to someone and say hello. And you might wait up to 40 minutes, uh, up to 50 minutes for the person to say hello back. So the way you interact with mission support back on Earth changes a lot. So it's those questions that this particular product, uh, project is interested in. I've used the word analog. What is an analog? An analog is a place on Earth that is similar in some interesting ways to the target environment in space. Now, those similarities could be geological, they could be physical, they could be visual, they could be psychological. Um, no analog is perfect. There's no place on Earth that's just like Mars. Obviously, everywhere on Earth is Earth gravity, not Mars gravity, and so on. But there's some places that have some traits in common. And so these analog places can be useful in a number of different ways. One of the ways they're useful is to discover problems and test solutions to those problems. So, for example, uh, if we look at sleep disruption, there's issues to do with sleep disruption that you don't really discover until someone has been in a particular environment for weeks or months. Um, and if you're going to test a solution to a problematic sleep environment, you're going to need to test it over weeks or months as well. So analogs are useful for discovering those kinds of issues and uh, trying out various solutions to them. It's an important one for uh, software engineering is we use analogs to design in the context of use. So it's a, it's a basic rule of uh, software engineering in industry and, and uh, here on earth, that it's a really good idea to design in the context of use. What I mean by that is you don't just take your programmers and sit them in a little white room and tell them to start thinking about how to solve something. You send them to the place and to the context where that software is actually gonna be used and uh, let them design there. So for example, if you're designing a medical records uh, software, you go to the hospital, you go to the doctor's office, you see how they use paper records. They see who uses the paper records and what they do with them. Um, and then once you've designed a prototype, you take it back to the hospital, to the doctor's office, and you test it with them so that you can revise it. The problem with that in space is that we're not gonna send our software engineers to Mars before we send our astronauts. Just doesn't make sense. Uh, so instead, what we can do is we can uh, send them to an analog environment, and then they can develop their prototypes, and they can test their prototypes in this analog environment. It's not as good as testing them on Mars, but it's uh, much better than not doing anything. And then uh, finally, we use analogs to integrate systems in realistic scenarios. So this is an analog. It's called Pavilion Lake. It's in Canada. And you can see it's not a very good Mars analog physically. It's, I mean, it's water. There's no lakes on Mars. Um, but it's quite a good analog operationally because here you have a, an astronaut in a mini submarine. Um, you have another astronaut in scuba gear and you have an autonomous uh, underwater probe. So these different modalities could correspond to an astronaut in a rover, an astronaut in a spacesuit, and again, an autonomous um, robot. And they have to work together in this quite hazardous environment on a complex 
scientific task. And that is quite similar to the kind of thing astronauts might be doing on the surface of Mars. So we can study how these uh, three types of exploration work with each other uh, and how we can improve how they work with each other. And those are good lessons learned for Mars. Okay, on to high seas. This is, uh, this is the analog I work with. It's at about 7,000 feet uh, on the slopes of Mauna Loa in the saddle area between Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea on the big island. And as you can see, visually, it is very strikingly Mars-like. The terrain around the habitat is very similar to geologically to what the terrain around on a young Mars might be like. It's not that it's eroded, it's, it's much younger than the surface of Mars, but then again, Earth has much more erosion than Mars does. So there's, there's a lot of features in, in this area, in particular lava tubes, that you might expect to find on Mars. Um, psychologically, it's quite a good analog. When you're in the habitat looking out the little porthole window, which you'll see in a minute, you really can't see any signs of humanity. Um, you, you might be able to make out the telescopes on Mauna Kea off in the distance. Um, you might hear, so the Puakaloa training area is not all that far away. Uh, when they're active there, you might hear things being blown up, but really there's, there's very little evidence of human activity in the area. There's very, very little plant life and very little animal life. Um, this is above where uh, the goats and sheep tend to come. So uh, really the only animal life in the area is, is insects and, and again, very little plant life. So uh, in some ways it's very Mars-like. Now, in other ways, it's not so much. Um, it, if somebody gets hurt at the habitat, uh, they could be at a hospital uh, very quickly. Um, and that's important as a safety feature for us. Now, people might say, well, clearly, if they can uh, get to a hospital quickly, they're not going to feel um, endangered the same way you would on Mars. And that's absolutely true. Uh, but in our case, we, we need to be able to um, press the crew in ways stress the crew in ways that we it would not be ethical to do if we couldn't extract them fairly quickly. So with analogs, it's always a bit of a balance of what you want to be uh, realistic and, and what's not gonna be realistic. Um, again, as I said, it's not realistic in that there's Earth's gravity, um, they're breathing Earth's air, uh, but, um, but some other parts are quite realistic. So there is a 20 minute delay in communications, um, they live in a relatively small space. They have to wear spacesuits to go outside um, and things like that. So why is NASA interested in this kind of analog? So we've been funded for three times by NASA over a, almost 10 years now. Um, and so clearly they're interested in what we're doing. And the reason they are is the way NASA looks at risk. So they've got a giant list of potential risks for missions. And these risks are colored either green, which means it's fine, we think we've got this under control, uh, yellow, which means yes, the risk is still there, but we think it's small enough or the consequences are small enough that we are okay with it. And then there's red risks. And NASA simply won't fly, fly a particular mission profile while there are still red risks for that profile. So a lot of research, not just ours, but other groups as well, uh, is about moving risks from that red column into yellow or green. So in order to do that, we need to have an astronaut crew or an astronaut-like crew. And by astronaut-like, I mean with similar educational background, similar professional background, similar psychological profile, similar skill sets uh, to astronauts. Um, we need to have a high fidelity mission profile. So that means that the crew are doing the kinds of things that we would expect astronauts to do uh, on the moon or Mars. We need long durations. So as I mentioned earlier, there's some issues that don't really arise until uh, well into, uh, until months in. And those are the risks that we are focusing on in our study. So we do missions from uh, four, eight and 12 months in length so far, um, and would consider doing even longer ones if it was appropriate for the research. We need this balance between crew isolation and easy access. So uh, I mentioned that for, for ethical reasons, but also so that we can do things like take away uh, saliva samples to be analyzed in the lab or uh, bring uh, new equipment to the crew. Uh, but we need to do it in a way that they stay isolated. So the way we do that at high seas is we've got a, um, a shipping container near the habitat, but out of sight of it. And we can go and put resupply items in that, um, 
in that shipping container and then the crew come and collect it later. So they, they managed to get the new equipment or whatever uh, without interacting with us. And then finally, uh, we need high level of control of mission parameters by the researchers. So there are analogs such as in Antarctica, stationed in Antarctica, or even uh, you know, military submarines or uh, other what we call serendipitous analogs. They're analogous to space, but they weren't designed to be that way, which are fast fascinating to study. And we do study those too. But for the kind of research we're doing at high seas, we need to be able to control things and change things. So for example, if we're testing um, lighting that will improve the crew's sleep, we need to be able to change out the lighting. And uh, a submarine or an Antarctic station just wouldn't allow us to do that. So those are the real strengths of high seas. And the two main reasons to have it here in Hawaii, well, there's several, but, but the two main ones are um, the relatively small difference in the seasons, meaning we can do these really long duration studies. If we were to try to do that in Utah or in Antarctica, the seasonal swings would just be so large, they might um, drown out the effects that we're looking for. Um, and also that lovely um, uh, geological similarity to Mars, or at least to a young Mars. Um, and that's, that's really nice. Um, it helps that we also have all these uh, conditions in the US. Um, there's other sites around the world where you might be able to find something similar, but uh, in the US, Hawaii is definitely the best place to be doing this kind of thing. So talked a little bit about the delay. Uh, it's a, a technological problem um, in the sense that you need to be able to communicate to the crew, not using radio, you're probably gonna use something asynchronous like email and so on and so forth. But it also has a real organizational change for NASA. So right now with NASA, mission control is in control. Uh, the space station is flown from the ground uh, and mission control have the astronauts scheduled down to the minute. Um, and so everything goes through mission control. In a Mars scenario, we've got the longer um, latency, the crew's gonna have to be much more autonomous and also because the mission is long. So they're gonna face circumstances that they haven't necessarily trained for specifically. Um, right now, if a, a crew member on the space station is going to uh, go on a uh, EVA on a spacewalk, they're gonna have been trained on every detail of that spacewalk for months, even years on the ground. Uh, on Mars, there's gonna be times when you're gonna go and need to do something that you hadn't realized you were gonna do before you left Earth. So there's gonna to have to be much more autonomy, much less of this, this sense of control that NASA has right now. And that's a, that's a huge organizational shift as well as a simple logistical one. And we're helping them come to terms, terms with that. So this is sort of a cartoon of the habitat. Uh, it's a dome, as you can see. Uh, it's, I think, please forget, about 20 feet across, 21 feet across in diameter. Uh, and it is on a site which was quarried to build the Mauna Loa Access Road. So what's one of the many things that's nice about that site is that when we came to it, it already had a flat area in it. So we didn't need to change the site at all to put the habitat there. Uh, you can think of the habitat as just being a, a large tent at some level, um, although it does have, uh, you know, more inside than your average tent does. Um, we designed it for six people. Uh, there's six very small bedrooms upstairs. Uh, and uh, the other part to the habitat is this shipping container here, which is where all the power systems are. Um, and it also serves as an airlock. It's not a true airlock because the hat isn't pressurized, but we use it functionally the same way that an airlock would be used. Here's what it looks like. Uh, we've had international crews and, and at this point, they're not there right now, but every crew, every crew member had brought their flag as decoration. Um, you can see the six small bedrooms upstairs. There's a toilet also upstairs. The main area downstairs is this fairly large reconfigurable area. This picture makes it look bigger than it is because it was taken through a fisheye lens, but it's still the biggest area of the habitat. This is where they work, they exercise, they socialize um, and so on. They've got a meeting and eating area here around the corner where you can't really see it. There's a kitchen. The kitchen is, is probably bigger and better equipped than a real Mars kitchen would be. But the first research we did there was a food study. So uh, there was uh, more emphasis on the kitchen than there would otherwise be. And then out of sight around the corner on this side, um, there is a, another bathroom with a toilet and a shower. Their shower use is very restricted. They get um, uh, 
10 minutes of shower time per person per week. Uh, and uh, they're very, very precious about it. They're very, we're very strict about it. But these crews being astronaut-like, they always try to be better than we ask them to be. So we have the crews trying to push that time down to four minutes of shower time per week. And on one mission, we even had a crew member who didn't shower at all for four months. Um, uh, yes, he was a guy. Um, now, before you grimace at that, it, that doesn't mean he didn't clean himself. He, he, he washed himself very well. He just didn't use a shower to do it. He would wash himself with a, a face cloth and so, and so on. Um, uh, the, other, uh, the other thing that's around the corner here. Join the meeting. Oh, there we go. The other thing that's around the corner here is a small laboratory, uh, which is where they do uh, some of the geological tasks that I'm going to talk about a bit more later. Here's the layout. Uh, as I said, this is the common area, dining, meeting area, kitchen, um, downstairs bathroom and laboratory. And this is it from a different angle. This is the kitchen. As I mentioned, it's, it, it's bigger than a kitchen would probably be on, in a Mars habitat, but it's also reconfigurable. Everything in here moves around. So if the kitchen needs to be smaller, that's easy to do. Well, I wanted to talk about the toilets for a moment um, because everyone asks. Uh, they are composting toilets. Uh, they're quite modern composting toilets. Uh, it looks like a regular toilet, but with sort of a, a, a box underneath it. And if the microbial community in the toilet is healthy and functioning, then every week or so you open the drawer at the bottom and there's inoffensive compost, which you could garden with or just dispose of. Um, however, if your microbial community is not happy for whatever reason, uh, then you get out what you put in. Um, which no crew likes. Uh, and we like to say that our crews come in as geologists, physicists, engineers, but they all leave as microbiologists because they all are very invested in having um, the toilets function properly. Um, I'm also gonna share a, a story about, uh, we talked about testing equipment over long durations in this kind of environment. So the toilets we use have been extensively tested by the company that makes them and they're rated for, uh, uh, four people each. We've got two toilets. Our crews are six, so that should be more than enough capacity. However, we had a lot of problems early on. Um, the microbial community just wasn't happy, and we couldn't figure out why, and the company couldn't figure out why, because again, they've tested this a lot. Um, but then we realized that their primary market is sort of cabins in the woods, right? Um, hunting cabins, uh, whatever, camping cabins. Um, and uh, not to be too indelicate, but uh, gentlemen, when they are in a cabin in the woods, don't tend to pee in the toilet. Um, they tend to pee on a tree or something like that. Uh, so what we found was these, these toilets were getting much more urine than they're normally tested with. And that was, that was the problem. There was more liquid than they normally have in them. So we fixed this by installing a urinal and that was fine, but it was just another little lesson in you don't know how something is gonna work until you've tested it in an analog environment over long durations. Um, so that was a good lesson learned. Um, this is the upstairs. Uh, as you can see, they've got these tiny little bedrooms. Each room has a small bed in it, um, just a side of one of those uh, small foam futons, uh, a little desk and some storage. They do have a door that shuts and locks though, and that's really important for crew privacy. Um, they have okay auditory privacy. Uh, if, if someone's talking in one room, they can pretty much be heard in the next room, which is not ideal, uh, but uh, so it goes. You'll see also because they're in a dome, this back wall is slanted. So the rooms are actually even smaller than they look. So if you, if you were to sit on this bed, you wouldn't be able to sit up straight. You'd have to be leaning forward because of the sloping wall. The power systems are uh, completely off the grid. So the main power source is solar. And then inside the habitat, there's a giant battery bank. It's a, a really sexy battery. And I, I think it's weird that I would use that term for a battery bank, but it's uh, these Sony batteries. Um, and they, they even when they're charging and discharging, they stay absolutely cool. And, and they're, they're quite remarkable. Um, so normally, I would say 95% of the time or even more, that all works just fine because the weather at the site is very consistent. Every once in a while, we'll have a couple of cloudy days in a row. Uh, and in those days, we go to a backup propane generator. 
A propane generator is not realistic for Mars, but of course having some sort of backup system is realistic. Um, this image is a little bit old, but we have a dashboard where we, we use to observe and collect data on all the systems, because even though we're doing psychological and team research, uh, all of this data is useful. So what are the temperatures in the various parts of the hab? What are the CO2 levels? Uh, how much uh, power are they using? Um, how much power are they getting from the solar panels? Um, how much water are they using? Uh, what's the weather like? All of these things are are important and useful. So uh, this is what both the crew and mission support have as their um, dashboard. So what are they doing at Habitat? Well, we try to make it as realistic as possible. So in addition to uh, filling out surveys and things like that for our research and uh, keeping the hab clean and cooking and eating meals and keeping the habitat systems maintained, they're also doing these geological field tasks. So this is a way for us to not only keep their work realistic, but also to measure their performance, because we're really interested in how their performance changes over time. So we give them a series of assignments. Um, these are things like um, uh, map out the lava tubes in this area, uh, investigate the skylights and map those out, estimate the volume of this lava flow uh, and things like that. And then they come up with a plan and they go on an EVA an EVA just stands for extravehicular activity, and it's our NASA term for going outside. You'll notice if you work with NASA at all that they love three-letter acronyms, or TLAs, as we like to call them. Um, so uh, they go on these EVAs, and they, they carry out the task we've assigned them, uh, and then they send us a report, and we grade them on that. So this is that cycle. I mentioned autonomy earlier. Again, it, with the current way they do stuff at the space station, all of those tasks they've been trained for down to, down to the minute, um, nothing is improvised. Uh, whereas our crews have much more autonomy. So we give them a task, but they decide how to carry out that task. So they uh, plan out their EVAs, um, they make EVA requests, and then ground approves those EVAs, they carry out the task and the crew submits the report. So this uh, in this cycle, the green fields here are what's decided by ground, and the orange fields here are what's decided by the crew. A lot of the field work we do is centered around lava tubes. Lava tubes are really interesting uh, for several reasons. One is we're pretty sure that they exist on the moon and Mars. So that in and of itself would be a reason to explore them. Um, also, uh, because they're protected from the weathering, um, you can get more of a geological history uh, from the rocks in lava tubes. So they're interesting for geological reasons. Um, for interesting life reasons, um, as Mars lost its atmosphere and got the surface got more exposed to radiation, you might imagine that life, if there was any, would have retreated to these lava tubes. So they were a really good place to look for signs of past life or who knows, even current microbial life. Not expecting little green men, but um, microbial life might still be continuing in those lava tubes. And that's partly because of the protection from radiation, but also um, the conditions might be stable for uh, water ice. And water, as you know, is a, an important ingredient for life, at least for all life here on Earth. And then also for uh, exploration purposes. So uh, our astronauts need to be protected against radiation too. Uh, so there's some proposals to build the habitat in a lava tube if it's big enough and stable enough. Um, and there's also proposals to maybe build shelters there. <coughs> if, um, excuse me. Shelters that the crew could retreat to in the case of increased uh, radiation activity. As I've said, um, we're interested in, in how do you select a crew, train a crew and support a crew to be successful on these long duration missions. And I really like this quote from Anna Karenina. It's the first line. All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And that's something that we've seen with our crews as well, is when they're doing well, when they're a happy family, they're very similar to each other. They are having some of the same strategies. They're having some of the same uh, communication styles, psychology, and so on and so forth. Um, but when they're not doing well, they're actually quite different from each other. And NASA would have really liked it if we'd come back from our research and said, you know, look, all you have to do is prevent 
problem X, whatever it is, um, a clash of personalities or um, a clash of leadership and followership styles or uh, romantic issues. As long as you pre prevent that problem, everything will be fine. Unfortunately, what we found was that uh, in any group of people, some kind of conflict comes up. It was a different kind of conflict on each crew. So rather than just trying to prevent all conflict, which seems to be impossible, you instead want to pick, train, and support your crew so that they return from that conflict well, so that they're resilient. They return to a high functioning state uh, quickly and easily. And, and that we are able to do. Um, so uh, that was one of the big lessons that we brought back to NASA. Um, so again, we tried to pick our crews to be as astronaut-like as possible, so using the kinds of criteria that NASA uses to pick theirs. We also needed certain skill sets, so we needed scientists and engineers, a medical person, um, someone who's good at field work, someone who's good at laboratory work, and sometimes these skill sets are found in the same person, but typically they have to be sprinkled out all over the crew. And it's not just technical skill sets, we also needed leadership skills, followership skills, social skill sets as well. Um, we prefer to have a demographic balance. Um, this isn't just about gender, uh, but also you know, international uh, versus US, um, um, men and women, age ranges. Uh, we tried to have as much balance as we could. Uh, and particularly, we wanted to avoid isolation. So if you're gonna have a crew of men and women, you don't wanna have a crew of you know, five men and one woman. Um, if you have an international and US crew, you wouldn't wanna have um, five, People, five Americans and one international crew member. You, you really try to avoid isolating people. And the other thing we tried to avoid was fault lines. So this is where there's an obvious sort of demographic point where the crew could split. So for example, it's fine to have three men and three women. It's fine to have three scientists and three engineers. It's uh, fine to have um, uh, three civilians and three military folks. But what you don't want is to have three female civilian scientists and three male military engineers, because that's just setting things up for a split in the crew. Now you can't always avoid those splits, but you can spot some of the obvious ones and, and hand them off. Another way in which uh, we're, we're splitting a little bit from past practice at NASA is certainly in the early days of human space exploration, there was this idea of the right stuff, right? That there was, uh, an ideal astronaut out there and you'd pick your crew by how close they were to that ideal. Um, what we found instead is that you, I, I think a better metaphor is a toolkit. Um, you wouldn't fill a toolkit with just hammers, even if they were the very best hammers in existence. Uh, you need to have different skill sets, different strengths um, that complement each other. And similarly, you wouldn't fill a toolkit with Swiss Army knives. Swiss you know, Army knives could do a lot of things, but they're not really good at anything. Um, it's better to have crew members with different strengths so that they can actually genuinely be strong on them, not people who've got a little bit of training in everything. Uh, so that's the metaphor I prefer. Um, one way in which we're not very realistic is astronauts get years of training, whereas that's just not impractical with us, uh, but we do our best. And one of the things we'd like to have done is send them to the National Outdoor Leadership School, which is one of the ways that NASA trains their astronauts. So here, um, this is a mix of our group, our crew uh, in 2013 with the 2013 NASA astronaut candidate class. So they're all mixed together here. They're all doing the same activities. And that was a really good experience for our crew. We also give them theological field training since much of what they're doing is going to be that. Um, this is relatively brief, but it does give them the bare bones skill sets to um, interpret uh, satellite images, uh, to go in the field, to take samples, uh, to validate um, what they've uh, guessed from this, uh, <coughs> to ground truth what they have determined from the satellite photos and so on. Um, this was our timeline. Um, we've had uh, two four-month missions, two eight-month, uh, sorry, uh, we were going to do three eight-month missions, but I'll talk a little bit about the third one in a minute. So two eight-month missions and one 12-month mission, which is the longest one that we've done. Our first mission was a food study. If you start to work with that at all, well, you'll see that everything gets a patch. Patches are very important. 
Uh, this was the patch for that first mission in 2013. And you'll see that it integrates a spork and that is in recognition that it was a food study. Um, the food study had several components, um, but the main one for the habitat was uh, comparing completely pre-cooked food with food that involves some cooking. So on the space station now, everything's pre-cooked. It has to be um, because it's impossible to cook in microgravity. Everything just flies all over the place, just doesn't work. But if you're going to the moon or Mars, there there's enough gravity to hold things in a bowl. Um, and that means that some kind of cooking is uh, possible. But it is, is it desirable? Well, there's some trade-offs. Completely pre-prepared food takes a lot more packaging. And packaging is mass and mass is money in space. We're always trying to reduce mass as much as we can. So we'd like to get rid of that packaging. Also, completely pre-prepared meals, um, it's really hard to keep them nutritionally valuable, nutritionally stable over these long duration missions. They're great for a few months, but not so great uh, two and a half years later. And another problem with them is that there's less flexibility. So if you've made a lasagna, if you've got a pre-prepared lasagna, it is a lasagna now and it will always be a lasagna. But if you give the crew um, noodles and uh, tomato powder and uh, cheese powder and herbs and spices, um, then they can combine those things in different ways to produce different dishes. And that just expands the more the types of things that you give them. So that's really valuable. On the downside, cooking requires equipment, it requires time, it requires energy. So there's a trade-off between those things. So what things we're trying to help NASA do is figure out kind of proportions of pre-prepared food, um, cooked food, uh, and a different study, but grown food to, to have on these long duration missions. I'm sorry, my, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat today. A non-COVID frog, I promise. Um, this is what four month worth, worth shelf stable food looks like. We don't give them anything that requires refrigeration. It has to be shelf stable. Um, and some of this food is, you know, somewhat esoteric, like freeze dried meats um, and, you know, powdered cheese and things like this. Um, that we get from specialist suppliers, but an awful lot of it just comes from Costco. I very unglamorously spend a lot of time at Costco. <laughs> I could tell you where the powdered peanut butter is in um, every Costco in the islands. So um, that's that. And what they're doing here is they're doing an inventory of their food, um, but they're also, you can see these four bins. They've pulled out some of the things that they really care about that is really important to the crew. And they've made a month long supplies, oops, month long supplies of each of them. That's so that if, uh, you know, if the Nutella runs out and this crew was very fond of Nutella, the commander is Belgian. Um, if the Nutella runs out, you know, you'll have some more for the next month. Um, and that is, uh, that's really helpful. This crew actually refers in hushed tones to the Nutella incident. Um, where there was a source of conflict that no one could have predicted, where it was getting towards the end of a month and one crew member, not the commander, um, picked up the jar with the last of the Nutella and did that. Uh, and the commander got rather upset. Uh, so it was a Nutella-based source of conflict. Um, but luckily they were at the end of the month. So um, the next month's supply came on fairly quickly. If you're gonna lock people, in a habitat for four to 12 months, you wanna get as much data out of it as possible. So in addition to the studies that we were doing for NASA, we also did a lot of what we called opportunistic research. So this is other data that we're getting from the crew that isn't necessarily directly funded by NASA. I'm wondering where those squiggles came from. That's weird. Did I do that? Oh. I must've done that. I don't know how I did. Anyway, so it goes. Um, so in addition to the food study, uh, we did an exercise study down here, um, the, some crew members, well, all the crew members did a lot of photography. Um, we did a 3D printing study. Um, down here, we did a, a, a robot pet study. So here, the idea was that uh, obviously the crew can't have real pets in the habitat, but they could have these robotic pets and maybe they would be psychologically helpful. Um, interestingly, what we found is the crew members who grew up with pets really quite liked the robot pets and the crew members that didn't grow up with pets hated them. Um, and in fact, another moment of conflict was when the commander who did not grow up with pets um, kicked one of the robots. Um, 
he insists that it was by accident, but the other crew members were not convinced. Um, so the first study was the food study. The second one has this rather long title, but essentially what it was about was um, uh, crew cohesion and performance. So can I just see by a show of hands, how many of you have seen The Martian? I'm seeing quite a few. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I really love this movie, uh, not just because it's a good movie, but it, it makes explaining my job so much easier. Um, before it came out, uh, when I said I was doing a food study for NASA, they were like, oh, don't worry about that. Just give, give them like nutritional bars and they'll be fine. But now that when people have seen The Martian and see just how tragic a moment it was when the main character runs out of ketchup, um, they now understand that a bit of variety in your, in your diet is actually quite psychologically important. Uh, nutritionally as well, but certainly psychologically. Um, so this next study, as I say, was about cohesion and performance. And uh, cohesion we know from many, many psychological studies here on Earth. So when a crew is very cohesive, they tend to be high performing. Cohesion is related to performance. Um, however, they also tend to be more independent and that can be a problem. So uh, what I mean by that is a highly cohesive crew is more likely to say, you know, thanks ground control, but we're gonna do this our own way. Um, and, and that tendency obviously makes NASA a little bit nervous. And you, again, in the Martian, you can see exactly that. There you had a very cohesive crew on this Mars mission, um, very high performing, they do their work extremely well, um, but what do they do in the middle of the movie? Uh, they mutiny. They do the exact opposite of what NASA has told them to do. Um, so NASA is really interested in this relationship between cohesion and performance. Another thing that we were researching the, on these is passive me method, passive methods of capturing crew state. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, the most active method is simple report. So you, you ask the crew, how are you doing? The problem with that is that astronauts, when you ask them how they're doing, tend to say, great. And that's not because they're liars. It's because they're very positive people and they're stoic. Uh, and so they tend to perceive themselves and, and their crewmates as being in a pretty good state. Um, if you ask them if they're seeing any signs of depression or stress around them, the answer is likely to be no. Um, again, because they tend to be quite stoic and tend not to show these things um, that they're, uh, to their crewmates. So it's useful to us to um, have these passive methods that will detect issues in the crew state without relying on self-report. And for that, we have things, a whole bunch of different methods that we're testing. Um, one is, uh, example is basically a, a, a sociometric badge, uh, kind of like a, a Star Trek badge, um, which detects uh, crew proximity and the volume of crew voices. So if two people are standing nose to nose and the volume of their voice is really high, they're probably having a fight, right? Um, if two crew members never come near each other, then maybe they're avoiding each other and that could be a problem as well. So that kind of thing. Now, typically at this point, someone would ask, well, look, if you're recording the volume of their voices, why not just record what they're saying? Then you would know if they're having a fight or not, right? The problem is it would violate crew privacy. And again, you might ask, well, who cares about astronaut privacy? We're paying their salaries, they don't need privacy. The problem is, is that decades of research has found that uh, technologies that invade crew privacy are amazingly fragile. They tend to break very early on in missions. So if you want your equipment to survive, you do not violate astronaut privacy when it can be avoided. Uh, so again, we're interested in cohesion and we're interested in what factors predict performance and how they change over these long duration missions. Uh, I talked about opportunistic research. That's what this slide is about. Um, we had a whole bunch of opportunistic research. Uh, this particular one was looking at um, if you could 3D print, um, if you could 3D print uh, surgical equipment and if it would be as good as um, metal surgical equipment. You're interested in that because you're hoping not to have to perform surgery uh, and we wanna reduce mass as much as possible. So if you could only, if you, Instead of bringing all of this equipment, if you could just print what you need when you get there, um, that could save a lot of mass. 
Um, now we don't have the crew performing surgery on each other. Instead, they're using this uh, red rubbery looking thing, which is apparently how uh, medical students practice their suturing. So they would practice on that and see if they were as effective as with the metal equipment. So uh, the eight month crew, I've talked a bit about the four month crew. Um, the eight month crew was our first one to be in the habitat over the Christmas holidays. But what we find is crews tend to celebrate everything. They celebrate birthdays, half birthdays, quarter birthdays, international pizza day, um, whatever. They will have some sort of celebration. Here, the crew obviously is celebrating Christmas. Um, this crew was a little bit unusual as well. Oh, and by the way, obviously they didn't get presents from, uh, from Earth. Um, they mostly gave things that they already had to each other, which is kind of sweet. In fact, that's all they did. They made some things for each other as well. Um, so this crew was also kind of unusual in that uh, one way that our missions are unrealistic is that when the mission is over, I just show up at the habitat in a UH van and take them down the mountain, right? They, but this crew decided to do something a little bit more adventurous. And they, uh, one of the crew members is friends with someone in the Golden Knights, which is the US Army parachute team. Uh, so instead of coming back to earth in the van, uh, this crew did this. Um, they were picked up in a Golden Knights helicopter and dropped on Kona, uh, which is a very exciting way to, to come back to earth. And I, uh, I mean, you could imagine after all of that isolation and, and sort of relatively low visual stimulation to suddenly be flying through the air, like that would be quite a shock to the system, but they survived it. Um, this is our 12 month crew uh, and six went in and I am very proud to say the same six people came out. Um, I don't know if I was more worried about five people coming out or seven people coming out, which would have been possible given, given the duration, but no, the same six people, um, which basically made it a success. Uh, and then in 2017, we had another eight month crew. And this was about uh, crew composition. It was a little shift in the research that we were doing, but for the purpose of this talk, it was all about uh, crew composition, uh, cohesion and performance. And then we were scheduled to have another eight month crew, but unfortunately um, there was an accident at the habitat in the end, the crew member was fine. Uh, but according to our protocols is we had to stop the mission. So unfortunately this mission uh, stopped uh, fairly early on in it. Um, the crew were very disappointed. They were very excited about doing their, their eight months. Um, looking at future opportunistic research, uh, there's all sorts of things that we can try there. And also we're looking for, we've reached the end of the latest round of NASA funding. So we're now uh, talking to them about what to do next. Um, there's all sorts of possibilities. Um, here, what you see in the picture is uh, mealworms. Um, there are other, in particular, the Chinese space program, but, but several space programs are really interested in the possibility of using mealworms as a food source. They're great because they consume all sorts of waste, so including waste paper uh, and waste food scraps and so on. Um, they turn it into animal protein, which is, is great stuff. A lot of people really like it. Um, and they're much more practical, of course, than to bring you're not going to bring a cow um, to Mars with you. Uh, you're not even going to bring a chicken. So, uh, so mealworms are an interesting possibility. Uh, we were talking to a Chinese lab about testing. They had a mealworm farm, uh, which was sealed. So you would just put the put the waste in the top. The mealworms would grow. Um, they you would when they were big enough, you would cook them and then pull out the cooked mealworms at the bottom. Um, but unfortunately, I found out through the grad student that the the, the mealworm farm wasn't as sealed as they hoped it would be and that this grad student's first job in the morning in the lab was to sweep up all the escaped mealworms and uh, we decided that we weren't going to put that in the habitat we weren't going to risk releasing an invasive species on the slopes of Mauna Loa so um, we decided against that plan um, but it's something we might return to and a, and a lot of the other things we do are education and public outreach, including things like this talk. But we, uh, when they're when the habitat is not in use, we try to bring community groups there, such as uh, scouts or classes. Um, we've had uh, high school robotics testing in the area around the habitat, undergraduate research projects. Had a lot of media coverage, which has been pretty positive. Um, and then when the crews are in the habitat, one of their tasks, one of the things we ask them to do is education and public outreach. So they do blogs and video logs and food 
recipe contests and uh, all of that good stuff um, uh, as a way of sharing this environment um, with students and with the public. So on that note, I will stop. Uh, oh, no, one more. <laughs> uh, we were very excited at the end of the 12 month mission to have um, our very own President Obama tweet about us. He said, uh, congratulations to NASA and the scientists taking us a step closer to Mars. Now enjoy Hawaii and get it to shave ice. So, so I bought the cruise shave ice. It was a presidential order. You gotta follow those. Um, and then at the end of the next mission, the next eight month mission, I'm almost pleased to say we did not get a tweet from the following president. So, um, and I will stop there. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, Kim. That was fabulous. So interesting to hear about that incredible experiment. We do have a few questions that have come into the chat. Let's start there. And then um, anyone is also welcome to unmute their microphone or raise their hand and ask a question. So the first one is, is there an angle through which radio communications between Earth and Mars will be effectively muted by the sun's magnetosphere? Um, yes. So when they're directly on opposite sides of the sun, um, that would block communication. Um, but uh, what we would probably, it's not in place yet, but what we would probably do in advance of a Mars mission is um, have some form of relay so that it could go around in that situation um, because you really want to, would want to maintain that communication um, between the Earth and Mars. Does that make sense? Um, Okay, um, I can actually see, see the questions. Shall I just read them out? Oh, sure, if you'd like to, feel free. Okay, uh, do you consult with NASA's ISS teams for possible research questions at high seas? Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of um, overlap. Um, so there's indirect ways we communicate. So ISS will be, um, excuse me. The ISS is actually considered an analog in its own way. I right? said analog are places here on earth, but the ISS is a great place to test out technologies and so on for that trans transition from Earth to Mars, or Earth to the moon, um, uh, and even uh, for some equipment on Mars. So they're considered an analog as well in some ways. Um, so yeah, we communicate through NASA. Um, so part of the way NASA sets up that uh, set of priorities and risks to tackle is through um, the ISS work and the ISS teams. Uh, but also we, we all go to the same conferences uh, and we, we chat informally about it as well, about where we need to go next. And I think that's actually some of the ways in which we've had um, the most influence. So really by banging this gong of uh, Mars crews will require more autonomy, Mars crews will require more autonomy. And I think that message has, has gotten back to um, the other parts of NASA. So they've actually been running some studies at ISS about autonomy. So um, could the ISS crew be more autonomous and have more control over their own schedule and uh, their own um, activities? Um, okay. Uh, would you say that in part what you're doing is social science? And if so, do you collaborate with social scientists in this program? Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, there's a social science aspect. Um, most of my team, I'm not, I'm a computer scientist uh, with the, uh, multidisciplinary background, but uh, my research team are mostly um, organizational psychologists. Uh, so an organizational psychology has a big overlap with uh, sociology as well. So yeah, uh, as I say, most, most of my team are more in um, psychology, social science uh, part of things. Um, and just to, people tend to ask, you know, why is a computer scientist running this? Um, my my background is not very traditional computer science. So my PhD was in artificial intelligence and at Edinburgh where I did it, um, AI department is its own department. And it actually didn't come out of computer science. It came out of epistemology, um, which is the study of knowledge. Um, and it had close relationships with psychology and cognitive science. So really my, um, my academic background is a lot closer to psychology than it looks on paper. Um, Okay, going down. Uh, uh, nutritional science may be outdated. Any research into biological science with respect to nutrition? Um, so the food study that we did uh, was, it, it was about 
nutrition played a role in it, but it was much more about um, the, the factors I brought up earlier, which is sort of an engineering trade study on shelf-stable uh, pre-made meals versus uh, some form of cooking and, and the requirements for both of those things. Um, that said, um, uh, NASA has got a big food team um, and they're just about to do a whole new series of studies uh, in a long duration analog, not high seas, but a different one, um, which is entirely focused on food. Um, so they're doing a lot of work on that all the time. And, and they're, I'm not a nutritionist, so I am not necessarily up to date on the latest research, but those teams definitely are. Um, what you say would be one of the most unexpected results from the high seas experiment? Um, you know, it's funny, uh, a lot of it when you look at it after the fact seems pretty not surprising, um, but uh, still there's a lot you don't anticipate. So um, one of the things we found, uh, well, okay, so if you just pick people off the street and you put them in the hab, in the habitat, uh, they would, they'd be at each other's throats within days, if not minutes, right? Uh, we, we pick our crews to be really quite good at this. Um, and, but we weren't sure, we were fairly confident that even though they were really good at being analog astronauts, that it would break down at some point. So one of the things we found was that really for all the crews, things started to go a little bit wrong in terms of their, their crew, the crew structure tended to break down, conflict started to arise at about six months. Um, seemed to be kind of the magical number, plus or minus a few weeks. Uh, and so for that reason, we've recommended to NASA that they really don't do missions shorter than eight months. We found that our four-month missions almost went too smoothly. They just, uh, the kind of people who are picking handle four months without really much in the way of problem. Um, and if you just do it to six months, then maybe the fact that you wouldn't see the conflicts that are just starting to emerge if it if you ended at six months. So we recommend eight months. That was kind of surprising. Um, there were a whole bunch of little things that were surprising. Uh, so for example, I talked about the 3D printer. Um, we mostly thought of it as being a very practical thing so that they could print parts as they needed them in case something broke down. Um, but at one point, uh, you know, one of our female crew members, her hair was getting longer and longer. She didn't really want to cut it. Um, so, and she hadn't brought any barrettes with her. So she emailed her family and her family had a great time searching the internet for different patterns for barrettes um, and modifying them, you know, putting butterflies on them and things like that. And then sent her the 3D pattern that could then be printed from the printer. So she had barrettes. And then this set up a whole wave of other crew members doing similar things. It was a really nice way for their family at home who couldn't be with them physically, who couldn't give them physical gifts to kind of give them a physical gift um, via the 3D printer. So that was that was really lovely. Um, and I also think this, this point I made earlier about every crew having different kinds of conflicts was a bit surprising. I really did think maybe one or two types of conflict would be more common than others, but we really found it, it was very diverse. It's something that you can't, uh, you can't, you can't prevent conflict at all, but you, again, you can, make sure your crew is resilient. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, seems like must, much of this should be tested on the moon first. Is there such a plan? Yes, there is. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, a lot of the active work at NASA right now is pivoted towards the moon um, because the plan is to go there first, test out a lot of the systems that would eventually be tested on Mars and, um, and then go on to Mars. However, that said, there is a pretty strong argument to going straight for Mars, if that's your goal. Um, and it's more sort of political than it is practical. Practically speaking, scientifically speaking, yes, going to the moon first is a great idea. However, um, these things take time. You know, it takes, the moon program was very compressed and that's because they were willing to throw as much money at it as necessary. Um, but if you're not gonna do that, uh, then from you know, a president saying, we're going to go to Mars and actually getting there, it's going to be roughly 20 years-ish, okay? 
Um, and one of the problems with NASA being so popular on both sides of the aisle is that every president who comes along wants to make their mark on it. So every four to eight years, NASA gets told to change its direction, which is really unfortunate because it means that they are four to eight years down this 20 year path and then they're doing something different. Um, so if you really, really wanted to get to Mars, politically speaking, it might be a really good idea to just go straight to Mars and, and, and not go to the moon first because then you would be maybe far enough down that path that the next president wouldn't, um, wouldn't change direction. Are we doing on time? Okay. Um, do I have to stop or can I keep going a bit longer? You're welcome to keep answering questions if you'd like to. <laughs> okay, let's, let's keep going for now. Um, your subjects are astronaut-like. Are there plans to have similar projects for the actual first astronaut crews with actual equipment that will accompany them? Um, I think that is very likely to happen. Um, it's a little far out to say plans, uh, but uh, one of the recommendations we've made to NASA is that when they're choosing their crews, they should test their crews in an analog environment first um, so that they can see whether this crew who looks pretty good when you put them together, whether they do well over say eight months in the habitat. <coughs> there would also be, that also would be an opportunity to train them on the actual equipment that would accompany them, or at least some of the actual equipment. There's problems with um, training them on some kinds of equipment. So using a Mars, a Mars spacesuit on earth is a problem because it's gonna be three times heavier than it would be on Mars. Um, and also as a life support system, if something went wrong with it here on earth, um, being stuck in the suit would kill you. So that's not great. Uh, so some equipment would be hard to test in an analog, but a lot of it you would try to do um, as much as you can. Um, okay, and I think that's all of the questions in the chat. Does anyone have any ones they want to do verbally? If you, if you want to take one more at least, Kim. Happy to. This is Bex, I just sent you an email to, um, I had two questions. One is, I'm just curious how likely you think it is that caves or the lava tubes will become some sort of habitat environment on the moon and Mars. And the second question is, what holes um, are, are there in the microbiology research that you've seen in this project? Where, where is it that you guys are really lacking in an understanding of the microbiology in your simulations? I'm really not a microbiologist, except in terms of toilet care. Um, uh, but uh, let's so let's jump to the lava tube question first. Um, so there's a lot of discussion about putting habitats in lava tubes, but I think that a lot of people having this discussion have only been exposed to very tame lava tubes, like Thurston um, at uh, the Volcanoes National Park, which you know, has a nice little walkway through it and has lights and has had all of the debris cleared out of it. Um, so real lava tubes in the wild tend to be um, much rougher. You know, you access them through skylights, there's a pile of rocks at the bottom of the skylight, there have been fall-ins at various points in the, in the tube. So it, it might be a lot harder than we're imagining to just simply put a habitat in there. Um, and even then once you've done that, there's a risk that there might be a, a fall-in while you're, while you're there, which would be uh, clearly a bad thing. Um, that said, uh, we have reason to expect that maybe uh, the lava tubes on the moon and Mars are gonna be bigger than the ones here on earth, uh, maybe quite a lot bigger. Um, not really understanding, it may be that there are geologists out there who understand this much better than I do, but, but I am not 100% sure on how the difference in gravity would affect how these lava tubes would form uh, on the moon and Mars. And if they were much larger, then, then maybe it, it would be more practical than I'm imagining. Um, my, the way I'm thinking about it is that you might use them as a, an emergency, um, an emergency state habitat rather than a, the regular habitat. And that your regular habitat would be protected from radiation. There's several ideas about it. Um, the simplest idea would be to build your habitat and then pile rocks on top of it to cover it and cover it in regolith because um, that's pretty good protection. Another thing that's quite good protection against radiation would be a, a, a layer of water, either in liquid or ice form. So there's been discussion about using ice for that as well. Um, and your question about holes in microbiology. Um, 
it's really hard for me to speak to that because it's not really my field. Um, in terms of the crew, in terms of microbiology within the habitat, um, it seems pretty clear that the crew's microbiomes uh, change quite a lot when they're in, and they tend to sort of not surprisingly, because they're eating the same food and they're in the same environment, that their personal microbiomes grow closer to each other. That seems to be the case. Um, other issues, I'm not so sure. I should just say as a side note, uh, what, I've had a lot of media contacting me in the last year and a half or so, asking about how living in the habitat is similar to being isolated uh, uh, due to the pandemic. Um, and there certainly are some similarities, uh, but I think the biggest difference, and it's a huge one, is that our high seas crews choose to be there. Um, they really want to be there. And they really wanted to, this experience. Um, we picked them to be good at it with each other, whereas whoever you're isolating with is whoever you happen to be isolating with. You didn't, you didn't necessarily choose them to be good at it. And then finally, our crews know when it's all over. They know they're gonna be there for eight months and then come out and, uh, and we don't know that. So, um, so there's some major differences. There's some similarities though. Um, one of the similarities I would say is that um, it's, it's very helpful to celebrate things that mark the passage of time. I, I mentioned that the crew celebrate every birthday and so on and so forth. It, it's something to consider doing uh, it, at your home as well. Uh, so that it doesn't all just blur together into a giant pandemic Tuesday. Well, at this point, I'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Binstead. That was really a fabulous presentation, and I learned an awful lot about <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it just sounds like an amazing set of experiments. So thank you for sharing this with us. Um, I'd like thank to thank you all you for coming. I really appreciate it. Indeed. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, we're really happy to see you here, and especially to see so many of you coming back month after month. It's really wonderful to have you coming to our CNS webinar series. Uh, I'd like to thank the UH Foundation for their assistance in putting together, developing our webinar series. Uh, we hope to see you all soon. We have our next webinar lined up. It's going to be held on November 9th at 2 p.m. Um, so you can mark your calendars for that time. It's going to feature um, another faculty member from the Information and Computer Sciences Department. This will be Dr. Jason Lee. He's going to be speaking um, about his research with the visualization lab that he runs there. So watch your inboxes for invitations to that event. Thanks again, Dr. Binstead. Aloha, Thank everyone. You. Have a wonderful day or evening.